Hello everybody, welcome to Lee Wine TV. I'm Hello everybody, welcome to Lee Wine TV. I'm Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm your host Mark Fosco here for another edition of the show. So this is not gonna be a review show. I will be doing recording a couple of those a little bit later, not tonight. Uh, it's more of a kind of an update, 2019 update of what's going on, uh, what I've been doing the past couple of months and what's coming up in the future. Um, I'm also, it's gonna be hard for you to see it, but because the lights are going to completely blow everything out, but, um, I'm trying to, and so I've got, there we got photo of all that, and here we'll just do another photo. We'll do the whole shebang here. So, um, as you know, I've been kind of messing around with cameras and what I'm doing, and uh, so right now I'm using the DJI Osmo Pocket. That's, I'm actually looking into that camera. As you saw in the photo, I probably just popped up. I've got, um, I've got my regular video camera going on. So I've been really debating as to whether or not I want to um, start bringing that camera with me again. Uh, I, can, I, don't need an, I don't need a power outlet to use it because I have, I, which actually the DJI Osmo is, the pocket's actually plugged into it. One of those, you know, like USB battery things. So I have the type, I have like the right cabling and all that so I can plug the uh, Canon Vixia into that. Um, just in general, like the Canon Vixia just has really just kind of superior everything. And even though it's only 1080p, I'm recording this in 4K, 60 frames a second. Um, the Canon is recording in 1080i, technically uh, 30 frames per second. Um, but you know, everything gets you know, set up for 1080p, yada, yada, yada. But I mean, the, the Canon in general has superior everything. Uh, I can control white balance and exposure, whereas the Pocket, I can't control white balance. Uh, it's only kind of an automatic white balance, but I can expo control exposure, shutter speed, and all this other stuff that really video doesn't use. It's more about DSLR type stuff. So getting into the DSLR side of things where cameras, digital cameras that can shoot video, has been not necessarily confusing, but just it's like having to translate in my head, well, how does that apply to video? Because in video, I just have exposure and white balance. That's all I need. I don't need shutter speed necessarily because it's a fixed shutter speed and there's no ISO in these video cameras, these camcorders. So it, it's kind of a fixed thing. They also don't have um, field of view, neither does the pocket, nor does you know, the, well, these kind of, you can kind of get like that faux bokeh thing. Um, but the, the point is that I can control the pocket with my iPad. So I don't have to use the phone. The biggest problem I have with the phone and using the Filmic Pro app is that sometimes things happen where the phone just kind of craps out. Um, I haven't had the pocket do that as long as I actually start it. Uh, so last episode, I had to, I, I thought I had started the pocket and then about five minutes into it, it has an auto shutdown feature. So I spent five minutes talking to the camera and nothing happened, nothing was there. Um, so I'm kind of doing that. I'm playing around with, with, with using that. The only thing I don't like about the, uh, the, the pocket and the newest and latest and greatest, um, uh, which is their action camera, which I like because it has like my Canon Vixia, it has like a you know an LCD screen where I can actually see myself, so I wouldn't need the iPad to look at things, but I, that's fine. But uh, they they only record in four gigabyte uh, segments of video, and then you have to put them together. So far with the Pocket, I haven't had any issues with um, dropping frames. I guess a few years ago with the drones, 
uh, if you were trying to take continuous video. And it's about 10-ish minutes, um, depending on what resolution and bit rate and all that stuff you're doing. But when, when the file hits four gigabytes, it just, it, it, it finishes the file and it just keeps going. And I guess in the, the drones, there was like a few frames that were dropped or not recorded, but I haven't seen it with the pocket. So it seems like it's doing really well with that. Um, as I, I've definitely done it a few times and I haven't seen any dropped frames. Whereas something like this or the Canon, there's no such thing as that. It's just one continuous video file. I prefer that mainly just because it's kind of a, I just don't like having to figure out, you know, how many of the video files when it's all on one card to, to do that with. But I have a 256 gigabyte card in this thing. I have actually two of those SD cards and uh, all that kind of stuff. So I'm going to, so today's video and then the videos I record, they're going to be reviews uh, between now and Oregon. I'm going to use the pocket along with the Vixie as backup in case something screwy happens with the pocket, uh, but I plan to have a good, you know, 10-ish, almost 12 episodes before I go to Oregon. So, speaking of Oregon, so uh, if you followed me on uh, social media, I saw that there was a little confusion um, as to where I was going, whether it was going to be Oregon or Bordeaux, or Spain, Bordeaux, or Europe. I, th I think I I think I specified Spain and Bordeaux, uh, and ends up, I'm going to Oregon. So Oregon was the original, as you saw in my videos, the, the, the last set of five, um, I said I was going to Oregon. That decision had already been made in my head, like back in May, April or May, but I kind of got distracted. Uh, a friend of mine was like, hey, I'm going here, and all you gotta do is buy the plane ticket, basically, and everything else is taken care of. So why wouldn't I say yes to that? Um, but, uh, he couldn't get me the information that I needed as far as the exact dates and when we're going to be meeting up and, and really in my head confirmation that I didn't have to pay for any accommodations, all my meals are taken care of unless I go out on my own, um, and where we were going, like the actual appointments. Plus, not to, not to um, turn down the opportunity to go to basically the, the best of the best in Bordeaux, which is what we were supposed we were supposed to do and also in Ribera del Duero but I when I do my trips I'm expecting to do interviews with people and it sounded like this is more like not a junket but like a group of people were going and the opportunity for me to do an interview with somebody was probably slim to none so while it'd be a great opportunity to go visit these places and I do want to go back to Bordeaux especially if I can go visit First Growths and you know, Grand Cru Class A A's and, and the top of the top in Pomerol and Santa Emilion, Santa Emilion. Um, at the same time, I want the interviews because I don't know when I'm going to go back to Bordeaux and have that opportunity. So I'd rather go when I can interview people. So uh, Oregon it is. Uh, as of right now, today is the 7th. It's still the 7th. It hasn't crossed over to the 8th, which is my birthday, by the way. Um, and I will be 52 and... Um, I say it every year my birthday, I make whatever the age is, which is of 52, uh, or will be in 20, 36 minutes. Um, I make 52 look good, just saying. Um, so if you didn't know how old I was and you thought I was in my late-ish 30s to early mid-40s, I'm not. And that's usually the age range people put me. Some people figure it out without me telling them that I'm at like 50-ish, um, but... A lot of times you can use uh, cues once you get to know someone, if you, they've never told you their age, there's ways to figure out how old they are and get pretty damn close, like within a couple years, if, if their facial features kind of don't match with the other things that, you know, their, their life experiences and things they talk about um, don't match. Um, that's usually what I go by. So a lot of times, especially like, you know, a lot, a lot of times women don't look their age uh, a lot of times guys don't look their age too, but there's lots of ways to figure that out, how old somebody is and get really close. When you first meet somebody, you might make a, you know, uh, an assessment that they're a certain age and then you find out that you're right or that you were wrong. But um, if you get to know them over the course of a few weeks or a few days, weeks or months, um, you can kind of start figuring out how old somebody is uh, and get really darn close. Um, so with that said, so Oregon, sorry, 
So Oregon, uh, as of today, I have, I think, five confirmed interview appointments, or they all should be interviews. Um, I also have, uh, I didn't start recording, right? Yeah. Um, I have one tasting appointment that um, it's just me for an hour, so I'm not going to have any tour, probably no interview, and I'm waiting on a couple others to uh, get me, get back to me. So worst case scenario, I think I'm going to have seven appointments, which that right there makes the trip worth it. Um, I'm going to be there from the 19th of October until the 30th of October. Um, yes, that's unfortunately the tail end of harvest this year. Sometimes they're usually, how I understand, they're normally done by the second half of October or they're like just the, the, the last bit finishing up, but apparently it's been a cool year. So things uh, were a little bit delayed in flowering and all that and the 100 and I think 110 days or whatever, Pinot Noir and Chardonnay and all those you know grapes take to ripen. Not all of them because some grapes are earlier or, or uh, have a shorter uh, growing season. Some Also some grapes start earlier, some start later, which means they starting i mean they end earlier and later too but it's about 110 ish days i think if i remember correctly on average um so you can kind of figure out okay harvest is going to be starting around this date so um this year apparently is a cooler year in oregon or at least willamette so um it's kind of pushed harvest back a bit so i have had a couple no's which i expected um because of you know harvest or whatever but so i'm going to oregon um so uh, the Monday through Friday, and then I have the weekend and the Monday, Tuesday. Uh, so that's seven days. And if I average one interview a day, I consider that a, a success from my Burgundy experience, which I pretty much had one interview a day. And that allowed me the other part of the day to explore. Now, there aren't like Grand Cru vineyards and necessarily touristy type attractions uh, in Willamette like there are in Burgundy to go to. But at the same time, you know, I can go visit other wineries, just go to their tasting rooms uh, where I don't need appointments and, you know, hopefully get some really great photography and all that. Speaking of that, so if you've been watching my show for quite a while, you know that a lot of times when I take trips, I usually make, it's usually kind of uh, excuse, you could say, for me to buy a new toy or do something different in how I do things. So this is the new toy. So this is the Parrot. Uh, it's either the Anafi or Anafi. Anafi seems to be the most likely pronunciation. It is a French drone company. This is, um, so I bought it refurbished. Um, if you follow my social media, I don't think I did on Instagram, but definitely Facebook. Uh, I had bought one that I had to return it because um, it didn't fully function. And what was the problem was, uh, so in this, in this drone, so you see it's foldable, very compact. Um, so with, with this drone, the SD card is right there. So it's kind of a pain in the butt. Um, but when I was taking out the one that came with uh, and I was trying to install it, just kind of figure out how it worked, something happened and uh, it wouldn't recognize the card at all. Um, so the Parrot has, um, uh, the, the Anafi has a known issue with SD cards where sometimes you get SD card error and a lot of people go just format the card I'm like you can't if it doesn't even see the card it's as if it's not there so I returned it I found this one I paid a slightly less than the other one um, the advantage of the other one is it came with uh, a compact case that, that had the drone it had the controller uh, and two extra batteries so th this is the battery I just took off um, and two extra batteries and it was not much more than what I paid for this, but it was kind of hard to find that deal again. So, and I really needed to get the, the, the drone. So uh, this is meant for uh, the show. Um, the goal is to, on my morning appointments only, uh, to take drone footage of the winery and or vineyards um, so I can use as B-roll. Um, if you don't know what B-roll is, that's like the, you know, when somebody talks and they show like video of something else. Um, show B-roll of like when I'm taking the tour or if we go to the vineyards or I talk about the winery, you know, pretty pictures for you to see. So uh, I don't know of anyone doing this in video wine stuff other than maybe like 
Jordan Winery's podcast. They probably have drone footage. I, I haven't watched their stuff, um, but I know they have a podcast. I think they still do it. I, st I don't watch it um, just because I have other stuff to do. Not, not that it's not worthy to watch, but uh, I tend to not watch a lot of other wine, especially wine review podcasts, because I don't want to watch a review of something I might review and, and, and like go off of somebody else's review. Just like when I read tasty notes, I usually skip over um, the actual notes of what it tastes like. I just look at like winemaking notes and vintage notes and things like that. Um, I do sometimes see ratings, but since I don't do ratings anymore, I just kind of ignore them. I'm like, okay, someone thought it was an 88, someone thought it was a 95, whatever. Um, but anyway, so uh, this is yet another thing I try to do, uh, I'm doing to set myself apart from what other people do. Now, why is it the only the morning appointments? Well, the reason is, um, so if I was just going to use the drone as a hobbyist or enthusiast or you know non-commercial, like commercial, like you know commercial venture, then I probably wouldn't have to worry too much um, about having two appointments in the day and taking drone footage of both. Um, but I plan to either Monday or Tuesday, since it's today's Saturday, uh, to take uh, what's called the Part 107 certification from the FAA that allows me to be a commercial drone pilot. Um, and once you do that, then you have a lot more restrictions that are imposed on you. Even if you don't take that, if you're just going to be you know, a hobbyist or enthusiast or whatever, a non-commercial pilot, there's still guidelines that the FAA wants you to um, uh, follow. And so the big thing is alcohol. Now, when I read the regulations about it, if it's not commercial, it just says don't pilot it under the influence of drugs or alcohol but it doesn't give you like anything else. But for the part 107, and this includes all pilots, whether it's something like this or your, your commercial airline pilot, you know, that, you know, you're flying Delta or American or whatever, um, they are not allowed to in ingest, and that's the word they use, ingest alcohol less than eight hours uh, from when they fly. So, you know, if you're scheduled to fly at 8 a.m., then your last drink needs to be at 11.59 p.m., all right? And you have to have a BAC of no greater than 0.04. I think you can have 0.04. I can't remember if it's 0.04 or less, or less than 0.04, which is more strict than driving for the most part. Uh, I think there's one, well, actually, all anywhere in the United States, it's, it's more strict. I think Utah right now is a 0 0.05, whereas most of the other states in the, in the country have a 0 0.08. Uh, and in Europe, uh, 0 0.05 is actually kind of the standard, though there are some countries that are like 0 0.02 or 0, um, but they, I digress. The point is that um, when I do my interviews, I'm almost always tasting wine. And spitting wine, as you see when I do my reviews here, I spit. Um, even if I'm only going to do one review for the day, I still spit it. Um, yes, there are times I, I drink it because of it's a you know, special occasion or like Halloween episodes. I tend to not spit those anymore. I used to all the time. Now I'm like, I'm just going to drink because I'm having fun. Um, but I'm also not going anywhere after I record this stuff. At the wineries, excuse me, about, I'd say, nine times out of ten, I spit 100% of everything, but occasionally they pull out an awesome wine and I'm going to like, well, I, I don't want to spit it out. So even if I spit 100%, the problem is that um, I haven't ingested the alcohol because I spit it out, but my body has absorbed the alcohol. A fine line of definition of words, right? But in legal terms, words are very important and sometimes meanings can be misinterpreted. And I actually went to the FAA uh, and I had some people on a drone forum when I said, I, I asked the FAA because nobody could give me a straight answer, like a legit, like definite answer on this. Um, and the FAA was kind of like, well, um, you're not necessarily breaking what they call the bottle to throttle rule because if you haven't actually swallowed it, but if, say, you have an appointment later that day and you're using the drone and you crash into something or you uh, hurt somebody with the drone, um, 
So if it's above $500 in damage, not to your drone, because you know they don't care about your drone, they care about like you fly into a building and you do more than five, $500 or more in damage, you have to report it to the FAA. Or if you seriously injure somebody, like, you know, if you bump into somebody and they get a scratch, you, you don't have to report anything because you know, so they didn't have to go to the hospital. You didn't have to, like, perform any, like, major first aid or anything like that. Like, you know, there's no kind of a, almost a no harm, no foul on that. Same thing with, like, you run into a building. As long as you didn't do a lot of damage, who cares? Um, well, I mean, the FAA doesn't care. Uh, I mean, you should care, but the FAA doesn't care because it's a minor incident and they don't need to be bothered with it. Um... So then they investigate you. The NTSB comes around because they handle all, you know, air accidents, right? And that would be an accident. Uh, they ask you what you did and you say, well, I was, you know, during the day I did this. Or they see your videos and they go, oh, they put two and two together. Hey, homeboy was at a winery and he spit, but did he really spit all that? And did he drink anything off camera? So while we can't figure out his BAC, if it doesn't matter because if he had one drink, regardless of his BAC is 0.04 or under, or under 0.04, he's broken the eight hour rule. And then now you get into legalities and fines and suspensions and potentially never being able to be certified again. So uh, they did say, you know, perception is reality in the email to me, um, which I had someone go, well, that's not a legal thing. Like, well, <laughs> A lot, a lot, that's what happens a lot of times in cases, the perception, I mean, there's facts, but then there's also the perception of the facts. Um, and uh, I'm not going to risk that. So when I do my morning appointments, the, any drone footage will be done prior to the interviews. Uh, and then if I do have an afternoon appointment, um, and I didn't have a morning appointment, I mean, if I had a morning appointment and then I have an afternoon appointment, then there will be no drone footage, but I'll do all the other normal, like, you know, use the pocket and take pictures and all that kind of stuff. So I'll have that type of B-roll, but I won't have any aerial footage. Uh, and I had to be very clear with everyone for this go around that I can't do that. Um, so that's what I'm doing with, with the drone. Uh, a few other things about drones. Um, there's actually, even whether you're a hobbyist or, or a commercial pilot with this, um, you can't fly over 400 feet in the United States. That's a fairly standard thing around the world. Some places are, like I say, like, it's by meters since we're like the only people that use Imperial units still. Um, and it's like 394 feet or 392 feet. But some other ones you can go almost 500 feet. Um, some areas and some others you can't go above like 150 or 180 or 200 feet. Um, but uh, for the most part, it's a fairly world standard. Um, the FAA controls all the airspace. Uh, there is a little bit of gray area, like if you fly over someone's house, um, are you violating their privacy? Well, yes, no, maybe so. It has, if the thing has a camera, it's just like, you know, it's just like having a, a handheld camera. There's some privacy, you know, it starts getting into the privacy stuff and, and or harassment. So you have to be careful with that. Um, and then there's also things like, you know, using someone's image without their permission. But then there's the flip side of if they had, if they didn't have an expectation of privacy, but you know you're not expecting a drone to fly overhead, right? So there's things that you have to be careful with uh, doing that kind of stuff, um, and how close you are to an airport, and does it have a control tower tower or not, and you know restricted airspace, you can't fly in national parks without permission. A lot of these things you can get permission ahead of time from the FAA. Uh, and they actually have an app, well, not their app, but there's other apps out there that you can get like instantaneous approval to like fly and control the airspace as long as you don't go above 400 feet or it might be 200 feet because you're like, say, two miles from the airport. Um, so there's a lot of little things you can't do with a drone, but the, the, the point is that um, I got this so that I have the ability to do that for the show. Now, do I make money at this? No. Um, but I could, number one, I could make money from YouTube though. The FAA is, re FAA is really not going to come after me if I didn't have the part 107 license because I made like five cents off of a video. It's not worth it, right? But let's say I, you know, have a portfolio and I go to wineries and, um, maybe, maybe I don't get an interview with them, but maybe I'm happy to be in the area. And I was like, if you want me to take footage of your winery and I, I do a commercial venture with them, I get paid for that. Okay, or wineries in Texas because they're my backyard effectively, 
or I decide to do other things like real estate, uh, construction, roof inspections for insurance, or you know, just general filming where I just put the stuff up on the internet to like you know, uh, stock footage, stock you know, video or stock photography, and you start making money off of that. You have to have a license, or I think it's a certification. Officially, you be certified, not licensed. It's kind of different. So that's what's going on with the parrot. Uh, with the drone. So I'm super excited about that. Um, the show is going to enter another chapter and uh, this year has been outstanding year. I've, I've done more in this year than I think I've ever done in any single year of, of, the, of the show. Um, I've definitely done a lot more travel than I normally do in, in, in a year. Uh, I haven't missed a week as far as um, putting content out since mid-December of 2018. Uh, and the way my schedule is going to be set up between now and the end of the year, I'm not going to miss anything. As a matter of fact, I expect episode 500 to be the New Year's Eve episode. So I'm uh, planning on having some, I'm not going to go crazy on champagne, but having some cool sparkling wines uh, to kind of celebrate that. Um, I've moved up to twice a week. If you've been watching the show, you know that I've done that uh, for the past, uh, what, month and a half now? Uh, doing twice a week's. Uh, specials like Halloween, Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's, they, they will be the only show for that week just because holidays kind of fall on weird days. Some of them are a specific day of the week, some of them being a date specific thing, it shifts the day. So instead of like trying to figure out, well, you know, a Monday, Thursday thing, uh, say like Halloween, right, this year is a, is a Thursday. Well, if Halloween was a Monday, I would normally put out the episode the, f the prior Monday, so there's a whole week to build up the Halloween because if you want to buy the wine and if I do any pairings and you're having a Halloween party or the same thing with other, with, you know, other holidays, you're going to have a party, I usually try to put the episode out with enough time that if you watch it when it first comes out, you can buy the wines. So when it's just like regular reviews and uh, interviews, I'm not really worried about the Monday Friday thing because yeah, it's, it's different. Um, but yeah, so I, with, with that said and that type of scheduling, I, yeah, 500 should be New Year's Eve episode. So I'm excited about hitting 500. I'm not doing anything. Yeah. I'm just doing that. I'm not going to a venue. I'm not doing a live audience thing for that. I did that for the 10th anniversary. You haven't watched that. Go check that one out. Uh, I think it's actually one of my best, uh, video productions I've ever done for the show. Um, Texon this past month in August was amazing as usual. Uh, you know, I did skip last year and for long time viewers or at least viewers for the past year, um, or at least who reviewed around that time knew that I had a heart operation and the recovery kind of just got in the way with Texom. Um, I do have to say that, uh, you know, every year Texom gets better. Uh, and this year definitely was better than the last time I went two years ago. I don't know what last year was necessarily like, uh, but I, I do have to say I'm almost positive two years ago. Um, if you put down you were available all day, they didn't necessarily schedule all day like they had in years past, um, which was kind of a welcome break. Uh, but a lot of those because, um, because they'd gotten so big that they couldn't necessarily accommodate, they, 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 they feed you. Not every day, not like the conference days, not necessarily, but those, the days leading up to the conference where you do all the prep work, you know, they're feeding you lunch and dinner. Uh, it used to be also like legit breakfast, but they kind of had to scale that back because you start getting too many volunteers. Um, so two years ago, they, they said, okay, if you don't work a certain shift then you're on your own for the lunch or the dinner, um, but that meant you, you like didn't have to work, it's, you know, 15 to 18 hour day. Well, this year, <laughs> Uh, I don't know if last year they were doing it, but this year I was working 15 to 18 hour days and I didn't take my contacts out. Uh, so I wore my contacts for like a week straight. Um, so like I didn't take, I, I wore my contacts yesterday and I just, I went to bed and I'm sorry, I haven't taken them out today and it's, it's, you know, the lights are making it kind of fuzzy right now. So I'm definitely gonna take them out when I get done recording this. Um, but uh, while it's, you know, and, and I'm not complaining about working those long hours. I mean, every other year I've done it, it was just that one year we're like, oh, okay. Uh, and I was kind of expecting it this year, but, um, they are great to work those long hours, but at the same time, I kind of wanted to be able to maybe like have a couple mornings. I didn't have to be anywhere, um, in the morning. 
uh, or maybe have specific nights off. And trust me, a lot of people do that. You know, when you when you sign up, you say, "Hey, I'm available for these day parts on these days." You know, if you put all day, they said you may be scheduled all day. Well, <laughs> you are scheduled all day, uh, but a lot of fun, and it was great to be back there. Um, it was great to help out. I got to pour, uh, got to pour one of the seminars, which I really never gotten to pour seminars before. Uh, I got to get in, I got to sit in on a the what they used to call the rare, uh, the rare and something. Now they just call it Psalm Foundation, but um, so like vintage wines from classic areas and classic producers. So I got to sit in on that one um, and just enjoy it. It was also like the last seminar of of that you know it was the last time slot of of the of the uh, conference uh among other seminars so i definitely enjoyed those wines and uh i, I nothing bad happened <laughs> i didn't have i didn't have any like knee injuries like i had like three years ago um unfortunately i did not compete i was only an alternate which is fine because you know that meant i didn't have any extra um uh, stress in trying to do that, but I did take the Saturday off like I had already planned um, But I didn't do a spa day. I just kind of relaxed actually I had to go buy clothes because I left my hanging sack with Sport coats and nicer pants and button-down shirts at home so that Saturday I went out and bought polos and nice pants and and uh, sport coat so uh, So you know, I got more clothes out of the deal um, and I also got to watch soccer and I got to just kind of, and I got to go to a friend's, uh, restaurant that he works at and sit at the bar and drink some really cool stuff and eat some great food. So, um, if I had worked that day, I wouldn't have been able to do that. So it was, uh, definitely, uh, cool to be like, Hey, I want a day off or I want like a certain, like say maybe a certain night off so I can like, if you have friends in Dallas or you just want to go do something, you want to go out and do something different from the group. Um, you can do that. But, um, yeah, the, the event uh, I love the direction Texom has gone, and I just think it just is better and better and better. And I look forward again next year to doing it. Uh, I'm going to try to go to the Texas International Texom International Wine Awards, which is also in Dallas. Texom owns that. It used to be the Dallas Morning News or Dallas Times Herald. I can't. One of the Dallas papers had a, a wine award for a long time, and Texom basically bought it. Um, so they run it. And that's in February. So I hope to go back up there and volunteer for that and, um, and all that kind of stuff. Let's see, uh, anything else for the rest of this year that I want to talk about? I don't think so. Um, it's a half hour episode, so thank you for uh, uh, hanging out with me. And uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. I thought there might be one or two other things. No, nope. other than that, uh, my day job is great. I work in retail, which I think I've mentioned before, so I'm really enjoying that. I've been there for almost seven months now, and uh, so the honeymoon period is officially over, and I still love working there. I still love going to work every single day and being more of a sommelier than I've ever been at a restaurant. So if someone someone thinks that you can't be a som at a retail uh, in a retail environment, um, they're wrong. Um, I know when I first started the pursuit of the som stuff, I. I know that, and there's always been debates of what, what a psalm actually is, um, but I even, I was kind of like, oh, I don't know about retail. Are you really a psalm if you're in retail? Well, now that I'm on that side, well, and I, now my view is a bit skewed towards, of course you are, um, but I had a great conversation with Devin Broly, uh, who's like basically the corporate buyer uh, for beer and wine for uh, um, uh, Whole Foods. <laughs> Some, I had a brain fart, and, but Whole Foods, and um, he and I had a great conversation. I told him, "Hey, I'm you know I'm working in retail, is where I'm working at," and told him my, my views of it. He was like, "I've been," he goes, "I agree with you." Um, I'm you know he's been try, he tries to make sure that he presses that point with the court that um, being in retail is just as much of being a psalm as as not as as uh, not as, as being a restaurant uh, or a wine bar. So uh, yeah, that's gonna do it. Uh, definitely click the links above to friend me up. Uh, I don't know how many. I don't know if I have any links below. Maybe I'll put a link for the for the drone. You can see what it's all about, and maybe my the the pocket the the camera I'm using. Um, yeah, so do that. 
Uh, if you want to help out with uh, the cost of going to Portland, um, then you, there's a donate button over there for PayPal. And uh, we'll see you again next time.